All right, then. Welcome back to European News Weekly. Um, and we're just on to our second part of our second hour. And uh, we're talking with uh, Charles Williams Diggs, uh, the journalist um, who's uh, working with uh, Bologna, apart from other uh, uh, sort of uh, media outlets as well. Uh, he does some independent stuff he posts out as well. Uh, so he's been doing his little job for a while now. Um, and he's been uh, covering the uh, Copenhagen, uh, sorry, he, co he covered uh, various uh, climate change. Uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, meetings, um, and he was in uh, Copenhagen at the time when the police tactics uh, were very uh, harsh, and uh, he covered that, and that's in uh, Bologna. Uh, for anybody who wants to catch that article, uh, I won't go through it all. It's uh, many activists condemn Copenhagen police tactics at Friday March while Bologna says to refocus on climate deal. Um, and, of course, uh, the headline says a lot about... Um, uh, about how unpithy Charles Williams Digg is with his headlines. Uh, but it does actually explain some of the details uh, uh, very clearly. Um, there were certain big issues there. There were independent journalists there to cover the, the, the issues. Um, uh, there was uh, independent NGOs there calling for focus on the, on the proper uh, uh, issues on, uh, of the day. Um, and uh, so we're looking at the mainstream media coming in, covering any little uh, scuffles there were, uh, but not, not talking about uh, the, the issues, basically, uh, that, that everybody was there to discuss. Um, so it kind of threw it through the whole process off. Um, so very important we have independent uh, journalists there. And um, uh, on our uh, WordPress site, uh, we're going to put a link to uh, Charles Williams Diggs Fund. Uh, he he has been, hasn't been able to get any direct funding. Um, so we're, there is a crowd uh, funding source uh, for his friends and uh, colleagues uh, who are passing it around. Um, and uh, we're going to put that link there. Uh, because we want to get him to COP uh, uh, in, in Paris, basically, and we need that independent sources. Now, there are some problems. We're going to talk about the problems with, uh, with the uh, process of uh, accreditation uh, uh, to be a, a journalist in the uh, actual um, uh, uh, conference itself. Um, and uh, because it's important for us, because we don't want to be listening about some young lad throwing a brick um, but we want to be listening about what they're going to do about the, uh, well, it's now projected, according to new scientists, a two degrees C increase, average global temperature. That means very hot in some places, uh, indeed, um, uh, in localized areas. Um, so we, we really need to uh, be uh, keeping our finger on the pulse here. And it will be people like uh, Charles Williams Diggs, in my opinion, that will be bringing uh, this to you. Now, I've uh, been following Charles for some time and Bologna. There's many good journalists connected to that, uh, that um, uh, outlet. Um, but uh, anyway, I'll bring Charles in now. And uh, Charles, I think we're probably going to run a little bit over time uh, because I think you've got some stuff that you want to talk about. And we've, maybe we can do some catch up on other things that we were discussing as well. I'd enjoy uh, that. Yeah, so uh, welcome Charles Diggs uh, once again to uh, European News Weekly and it's really good and uh, to have you here and uh, we certainly very much respect you as a journalist. Uh, you do good writing and uh, we, um, you know, I personally like the stuff that you're covering. So uh, basically, um, well, you know, there you were at Copenhagen. Uh, could you give us a little bit of a feedback? I mean, I, I hope I summarised it well, but you, is there anything you'd like to add to that, that little summary of why independent journalism is important? Um, sure. First, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, secondly, yeah, directly re relative to Copenhagen uh, COP15, um, that was an event which, um, as I noted in my reporting, uh, had some uh, demonstrations were severely discouraged by the police. Uh, and these were peaceful demonstrations in the middle of winter in Copenhagen where uh, families with small babies, et cetera, had come out for, uh, for about a hundred thousand person march from, uh, central Copenhagen out to, uh, the conference center where, uh, where the event was taking place, uh, where the negotiations were going on. And they were just going to gather out front with placards and that sort of thing. And I, I, along the way, somebody ended up chugging a brick through a window or something with one person. <laughs> and upwards of nine, ten thousand 10,000 people were then stopped and zip cuffed and uh, about a thousand of them were you know, processed and arrested. Uh, and uh, I remember 
while covering that event, I was doing a lot of running back and forth to uh, the grocery store for people who were there with their babies and who needed diaper changes and uh, were wait, waited, you know, as long as I say, about 17 hours to be processed. Uh, and taken somewhere warm. They were sitting on a, a cold, slushy street. Um, but um, that's uh, you know that, that's that's something that had you know some 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 resonance in in, in the international press for sure uh, when when I when I covered it. But um, inside the conference hall, uh, there was a disconnect uh, to what was going on outside and. For me, uh, what's most important for me to report in a in an independent way, where I can actually sort of hop the fence from being inside the, you know, the negotiating halls as well as outside the negotiating halls, where I can report on both what the politicians are saying uh, and what the uh, what the public wants, and reporting on what the politicians who presume to speak for that public uh, are saying. Uh, there was zero mention of any of the demonstrations outside, which I suppose is just diplomatic protocol and would be rude for them to acknowledge it. Uh, but at the same time, that's a, that, that's a, that's a critical element, uh, that you had people not only from a hundred thousand people in, in the center of Copenhagen is quite, that's a, that's a big number for a city that size. Um, so, uh, where I come in in my reporting, I mean, we really are. We're a, the, the the requirements for uh, for uh, the COP accreditation procedure have evolved somewhat since uh, since COP fifteen. It seems to me um, because I've I've never had accreditation problems with uh, any COP event um, up until now. And now, because I report for a source that is funded by an NGO, that somehow somehow constitutes a problem. And I've been told by the press office for the entirety of the UN in uh, New York City that yeah, I'm, I'm kind of unwelcome because I, I'm not a commercial source. Uh, I'm not, I don't represent CNN. I don't represent any of the larger American media. Uh, and I, uh, uh, as res even though we have uh, officially registered our websites as news organizations, uh, because of our NGO affiliation, uh, they don't want to hear from us. Um, so the rulemaking process, I think, since Copenhagen, uh, when there was uh, a a larger presence of independent reporters um, who are accredited uh, has been to sort of dampen that voice somewhat. Right, so that's quite amazing, that, isn't it? Um, I, th I, th I think basically when we're looking at that then, you know, it's, it really is, it, it seems that there's some sort of, uh, and it, you know, we can see that quite often, you know, Facebook where activists and in NGOs sort of uh, uh, posts are being manipulated down so they you know uh, there's various formula that they're using uh, so and, and we're seeing obviously the the news the media being sort of uh, the PR companies being very much involved in all these uh, these things so the the big threat really is with independent media because you you guys can report on stuff that uh, the mainstream reporters can't you know uh, mm -hmm. facts that are being discussed uh, things of this nature so it's, it's quite important that we get this uh, this independent uh, sort of news you know and, and views as well um, so I mean uh, sort of coming on with that I mean you know in terms of uh, uh, what, what do you sort of expect you know what is happening you know because you've got these big lobbying companies that are obviously as uh, Candice Paul was uh, talking about in her interview with her who are you know like Canada who've done deals with China multi-billion pound deals and uh, they can't get out otherwise there's going to be legal repercussions and uh, costs so um, these people are going to to the uh, sort of uh, the conference they're pressurizing the people at the conference to sort of you know meet their profit uh, requirements um, you know 
what, what, what do you see is the, is the kind of the hope? Who are the lobbyists for the, uh, for the other side? You know, for the people that are saying that there's a social impact here, there's, a, there's a, an environmental impact here. You know, we have to take this into account, the profit equation with the social and uh, sort of environmental uh, balance that we used to have at one time, which is now out the window, in my opinion. Um, what is our? What is? What can you? What? What do you see as as the 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 rebuff? Who who are really getting out there and and saying, look, this is really bad. We really need to do something. Right. Yeah. To to uh, to answer that, I've got to sort of walk back a little bit through uh, sort of, the, the, and I'll keep it very brief. But the technicalities behind the procedures sure, uh, sure. Uh, that uh, the UN F Triple C is applying. Uh, in terms of letting people in. Uh, you have uh, something known as NGO accreditation and observer status, and there will be large groups like Greenpeace and uh, the WWF and uh, uh, NRDC and other organizations like that here from the United States and worldwide uh, who have a lot of, who have been, who've been allocated a lot of observer status accreditation. Uh, smaller organizations, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm confused as to why we're getting so few uh, uh, NGO observer status um, uh, accreditations at Bologna, because we have a we have a room full of policy people who do nothing but who do nothing but talk about climate mitigation technology all day long. Uh, they are highly professional. They are they are they are uh, scientists who are offering out of the box solutions. Uh, to bring about the climate climate cuts that are necessary to hopefully meet the two degree rise uh, or keep us below that, um, it, and so they, in that respect, you know, you, you ha you'll we will have people on the inside uh, who are speaking directly to policy and speaking directly to. Uh, both small and large ways that participating countries can meet uh, the emissions cri the emissions crisis that we, we that we need to that, we, that needs to be addressed. Um, in that respect, um, or in that same vein, I should say, uh, the reporting on how that's done uh, is something that I don't think the, I don't, well, I don't think, I, I'm of the, I'm of the strong opinion of, uh, the mainstream media can't do a good job of, say, reporting on, for instance, carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, it's something that every once in a while comes up in the vocabulary of the DOE here in the, the Department of Energy here in the United States. Uh, there's a pilot project for a, something like that in all, of all places, Mississippi. Uh, that is several years behind schedule. Um, there is a CCS plant working, which stands for carbon capture and sequestration, uh, operating in Saskatchewan at the Boundary Dam coal-fired plant, uh, which is a big success. Um, but um, these nuances kind of get lost when you've got, say, you know, 15 column inches or less, uh, or a two-minute spot. Uh, on a major broadcasting network. Um, where I come in, uh, and where many other independent reporters such as myself who are uh, affiliated uh, with an NGO in the sense that they pay our bills to remain completely independent, um, is that we have, acts, we, we, have a, we have a better knowledge of the science. We can explain it better. We can explain the pros and cons. Um, CCS just as one small example, uh, is, is effective. Uh, it's also expensive. Uh, it's not something that works everywhere uh, just because of the costs. Uh, but it's something that's finally, over the past couple of COPs, uh, um, managed to work its way into the official dialogue. Now, everybody's going to miss that, except for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. And except for a few of my other colleagues and other independently funded uh, uh, media sources that are smaller than CNN or smaller than 
uh, the Guardian. Uh, nothing against the Guardian, but they uh, they don't have to they don't have to jump through the same hoops that we do to get in. Sure, um, sure. And um, in any case, I mean these these are this plus other forms of alternative energy that are readily uh, <laughs> present and and deployable. Uh, go undiscussed what we're going to be talking about in the main the mainstream media is going to be talking about numbers you know who's come with what commitment um that's the way it's already headed uh who's committed to what what numbers can we expect to see people post will that actually in fact equal the cut that we need to see uh with really very little about what has to be done to achieve those cuts sure. and that's where we come in and say well in order to achieve these cuts You've got to do A, you've got to do B, you've got to do C. And this opinion and in that opinion, it's not viable, et cetera, what have you. It's, but so it's my job to sort of draw those things together and make people understand, and not make, but you know, help people understand uh, what we have in the toolbox at the moment. Uh, because nobody, really, nobody in the mainstream media talks about that. What do we have? What can we do? Uh, I mean, I mean, I was looking at the other aspect with the IPCC, mm -hmm. you know, and and some of their reports. I mean, there's just one little bit here I'll pull up on because it was just a, an area that I was looking into, and that was to do with global dimming caused by airplanes, right? Right. Um, and and uh, there was a, a study done by Leeds University, and they took it. Uh, they did a presentation in, <clears throat> I think it was the American Meteorological uh, Conference of, I think it was 2013. And uh, and they just were mentioning that uh, that there's real big problems caused by uh, cloud cover in the west coast of Europe uh, and rainfall, you know, possibly, you know, but uh, certainly the cloud cover, um, and uh, and that was basically going to be causing uh, big problems. And it was from airplanes causing extra, you know, because you've got global warming causing extra cloud cover, uh, but you've also got planes that help to create clouds as well. So that that the, t the mechanism, especially along the jet stream, uh, was uh, was very much in place. Um, and they were looking at uh, should they uh, have alternative uh, uh, sort of uh, sort of routes to try and kind of break up the cloud uh, formation. Um, but uh, that was something that's been very much played down. And uh, uh, but when I was looking at the IPC re C report, they did actually have something about the global dimming issue. Uh, but it was kind of based. Uh, I think it was around about uh, not much later than 1990s, around that ballpark. This, the, the the report was done. Uh, whereas you know the latest report, you know from Leeds in 2013, uh, didn't seem to be taken into account. You know in the IPCC report, um, which would uh, skew a lot of the models that they're using. Um, you know, so if they're saying, oh, well, it's cooler there, then you know, then it should be because of cloud cover. Uh, then that's going to skew. Uh, the kind of uh, what is actually happening in terms of global warming. Um, so, uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, the way I see it, you know, we, we, we need sort of independent reporters to get this information out because I've, I've never seen that part of that story, which is, you know, it's, it's, it comes out of a, you know, Leeds University. So it's, it's not uh, something somebody's just made up. It, it's uh, done scientifically and, uh, uh, and it is still available on the web. So, um, but, but at the end of the day, so, you know, if we don't get that kind of reporting, uh, then, uh, you know, it basically means that the sort of the, the, what they're basing their facts on in terms of making decisions uh, in Paris is, uh, you know, that, that it, it's, it's quite uh, wrong in some respects. And uh, it seems to be, you know, from my point of view, uh, a little bit manipulated. And or if you see what I mean, it's... Um, I, I see precisely what you mean. And I would agree with that because uh, I see uh, my role on my website as an officially registered uh, media source uh, with the same standing uh, that the BBC has or the Guardian has or the Times of London or you know you can name a hundred other organizations uh, we have the same rights uh, of access as they do um, but we're smaller I, we you know we get on a, on a monthly basis we have a hundred thousand visits uh, we have people who are coming to look for very detailed information on precisely what you were just describing. Uh, we wrote a report on that report. Um, we examine what happens to what happens to to uh, 
uh, extra shadow cover as a result of aviation traffic and how that's how the, how the jet stream makes that happen and why that is an important issue. Um, and in that respect, when you have a group of reporters in that hall who are in, in that negotiating hall in Paris uh, who are reporting on the hardcore facts, who are, who are conversant with the reports, who are, uh, whose sources are the scientists who wrote those reports. Um, we then serve another, not, not only the, we not only serve the purpose of, of getting out the news as to what is happening to those pieces of the puzzle for solving the climate change issue, uh, we are also helping a larger, the larger media bodies who are behind on these subjects stay honest. Because I'm not under, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not laboring under the illusion that I am an alternative source for anybody who subscribes to the New York Times. Um, if somebody takes climate science seriously or environmental issues in Russia seriously or what's going on down here in the Gulf seriously, they'll tune into me. Uh, but, you know, I'm, it, it's, it, I, I'm not going to be the, I'm not going to be the newspaper of record that they crack that ends up on their doorstep every morning so they can get a general overview of what's going on. I mean, for instance, who in New York knows that, who, who in New York knows that 170,000 people on the Gulf will be dead within the next five years because of the Gulf oil spill? Not many. Um, that's now gaining some traction as other people are able to replicate that sort of reporting. So we are serving a purpose as independent journalists to bubble that information upward so that it actually does reach the mass audience that it needs to. Um, and that in and of itself is, I believe, an important tool. Totally. Uh, and we, we see, you know, similar manipulation of uh, figures. I mean, what they say is, you're saying 150,000, but what they would say is only 1% of, you know, the population is going to have problems, you know, it's uh, statistically insignificant or something, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, what, that, that's, uh, 150,000 in the Gulf, significantly insignificant to the rest of the United States, but yeah. for those of us who live within five miles of the sea, that's, you know, if we take into account that that's, you know, 40 million people live within an hour, a two-hour drive of the coast. Uh, countless more, uh, well, let's say, you know, if we, if we look at Florida's figures, and I don't want to get too sidetracked by BP, uh, but uh, the figure, the, the tourism figures that Florida uh, posts on a yearly basis are 67 billion people. It's one of the most popular tourist destinations in the entire world. Uh, it's the, the hotels tend to be cheaper than Hawaii or. I'll tell you that's 67 billion dollars. You mean worth? Uh, 67 billion dollars. Excuse yeah, yeah, me. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so that's that's their state budget. 60 billion dollars. Uh, 67 billion dollars on tourism uh, per year. Uh, the, anything that we see, anything that we see coming into the go Gulf Coast is either, uh, economically speaking, uh, uh, oil and chemical refining and tourism. Um, you know, but I know I know in uh, Japan we're seeing uh, sort of the tourism uh, PR being hyped up. I mean, it, literally, it's global. You can't go to anywhere on the planet where there isn't a Japanese fair promoting uh, Fukushima produce. You know, it's, uh, it's a crazy world. <laughs> Some very large watermelons. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but, uh, you know, in any case, it's, I mean, to get back to get back to sort of the fundamental, you know, weeding out process that seems to be done by a computer, uh, and then allows for it allows for you to you know sort of appeal via email uh, where you hear uh, uh, basically an argument that you know we just don't we don't want to hear from you um, you know we've, we're busy uh, you know I've referred this to somebody else to get back to you uh, here's their phone number and so you follow the you follow follow the voice prompts and and, uh, and until you hit a dial tone. Um, so it's, 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 it's frustrating because the, the other thing I'd like to add to this is that my press credentials, uh, being as they are, have never prevented me from, well, not prevented me, they've allowed me 
access to the Kremlin. Uh, they've allowed me access to uh, the, uh, the, the, the hot zones in Fukushima. Uh, they've allowed me uh, access to the White House press corps. I've ridden on Air Force One. I rode Air Force One to the, 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 the <laughs> COP15. Wow. Uh, wow. You know, and now all of a sudden I'm just some blogger. I mean, not just some blogger. Blogging is that, that's, you know, that's, that's the fundamental that I'm trying to defend here. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that, that, yeah, of course we've got a smaller audience, but it, that's, that, that's kind of the whole purpose. I mean, we, we speak to a lot of specialists. Uh, we also speak to a lot of people who are, who are rapidly opposed to the idea that climate change even exists. Um, and, and that's where we can outline the scientific points to say, well, you know, it does, and here's proof. Um, but in any case, I mean, we're, we're down in the trenches with public dialogue. Yeah, uh, I think the mechanism with Bologna is, is that, in theory, you'd look at the scientists, you'd dig up the facts, you'd try and summarize it in a way that people could understand, like a science media journalist would. Uh, and then that, that would then go out to to other media organizations, which it used to, you know, it used to go out to the BBC or uh, Le Monde or whoever would pick up on an aspect of a story that you've done, uh, may even quote Bologna on it, you know, um, and, 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 and that was working. But now we've got kind of a science media center. We had the, uh, we had a various um, uh, manipulations in, in government to uh, mm -hmm. kind of, make sure the science media center is what gives out the stories but i'm, I'm pretty sure Bologna has never been approached by a science media center you know? <laughs> no, they haven't given us a call <laughs> absolutely no, nor has crerad in france the independent french uh, monitoring uh, uh, ngo uh, who works with the nuclear industry uh, so these are the people that you don't get a voice to and then i know i'm talking about the uk which is particularly pro-nuclear because of the uh, nuclear bomb things they like making um, right. but, you know. yeah. but, but that's, a, you know, that's an important point that you're making there, which is, uh, it, uh, once, once you start to create, uh, government institutions that promote supposedly, uh, the science behind, uh, things that could be possibly harmful for us in the long run, um, that then marginalizes, uh, the voice of NGOs who are, whose job it is to speak for the public on very specific issues uh, and whose voice and whose job it is to solicit the opinions of the public as to what they feel needs to be addressed. Um, we are, you know, in a sense, uh, I mean, Bologna is definitely sort of the, the it for as far as Norway is concerned, uh, the, the shadow uh, environmental ministry. Um, we are a kind of shadow press uh, on Bologna.org and Bologna Roo uh, for uh, the mainstream press. Um, as I say, also accorded the same rights of access as they have. Uh, we just use it a little differently. Uh, we use it to study harder. Uh, we use it to hit the books harder. We have the same liability exposure as larger media organizations do, which means that everything we have to print is fact. Uh, you know, we don't have, you know, we don't, we don't take out, uh, you know, libel and slander insurance because, well, A, you know, on one, on one level, we can't really afford it, uh, B, uh, because, well, we don't need it because we do our homework. Yeah, you back, you, you back out the facts. I mean, the fact is that you are very well researched and that there is that intermediacy. I know with my uh, activism with Fukushima is that there had to be a, a sort of uh, people like Kreerad around to try and explain to us exactly, you know, what was going on. And, uh, uh, and then of course we could uh, make our own stuff up as well, maybe, or whatever it is. But, you know, at the end of the day, we, the, we did get a sort of a basic and it kept a lot of us on the straight and narrow and uh, right. basically, uh, you know, realized there was a problem there, you know, it was being manipulated quite clearly. Um, and, you know, it, it was organizations like that that uh, brought truth to, to a situation, you know, where people were saying everybody was doomed to where there's no problem at all. Um, and uh, we, had, uh, we, we had a voice of reason there just coming in saying, yes, there is a problem, you know, and that's, that's all I needed to hear, uh, right. my, own, uh, my own sort of belief system, if you like. Right. And there's a, it's, I don't know how much time we have. I have sort of an example like that to cite, which, sure. uh, which Go ahead, man. That'd be great. yeah, it was a, uh, uh, an event here in the United States where, uh, the, the New York times, very, 
proudly publishes very long report regarding uh, Hillary Clinton's involvement in a, uh, a, a, a sort of uranium sale slash swindle uh, that went to benefit members uh, or that is, uh, investors in uh, and donors to uh, the Clinton Family Foundation, uh, which the New York Times uh, reported as threatening uh, the United States strategic uranium reserve. Um, about three weeks later, uh, a group called uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists, which is uh, essentially comprised of former DOE officials, uh, uh, NNSA officials, that's the National Nuclear Safety Administration, which is a subdivision of the, uh, of the Department of Energy here, uh, and, uh, and a number of, a number of uh, highly regarded climatologists, plus their own publishing link where they took that story apart and upon doing the math, had any of the reporters in the New York Times managed to do this, they would have realized that actually the amount of uranium that was sold to Russia at the end of the day was statistically insignificant to America's reserve and thus posed no uh, uh, difficulty for the United States maintaining its defensive capabilities. Um, so that, that torpedoed in three paragraphs an absolutely enormous story about which they've run no correction or retractions that I'm aware of. Right. So, I, I, I mean, I've been uh, doing stuff, um, uh, uh, sort of blogging a little bit with, uh, was it Naomi Wolf? And mm -hmm. uh, she's, a, I mean, the New York Times and the Guardian and a few others, they, they'll print up really horrible stories slating her for covering a particular aspect of a story or whatever. Uh, because all she was doing was basically saying, look, here, we've got this story here. Any confirmation? Can we get second and third sources? And so on. Uh, so we'd do that, and then we might come up with conclusions like, well, actually, there's some, there's some credence to this story or not. Um, and, uh, you know, they put up a really horrible story saying how wrong she was. Uh, and then, you know, three, four months later, all oh, right, the truth comes out, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, no surprise to anybody who's on Naomi Wolf's uh, website, because they would have seen all the relevant links uh, with, uh, you know, two, three plus sources um, mm -hmm. to co confirm that that was actually the case in the first place, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I can hear where you're coming from there, you know. So. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, so my, my hope is that uh, between now and the end of the week that we can reestablish, you know, basically have some kind of open dialogue with the UN uh, that would allow not only myself to do uh, the reporting that I wish to do, Sure. Uh, from COP21, but uh, others uh, from the United States and Europe are in similar positions. Now, you, you and I had spoken a little bit earlier about uh, Greenpeace reporting from the inside, and those, those, they, they will be reporting from the inside, I'm sure, and they'll be doing a daily, if not an hourly, uh, blog report. Sure. Um, and the difference between, say, uh, and, and, and that's, that's stuff I, 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 I read and highly respect. Uh, it's well-researched. Uh, they do their homework, but they're also, they're, it's, they're, there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's something behind it that's a, you know, it's a Greenpeace agenda. Can I, can I jump in here I for a second, Greenpeace's please? Agenda. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Charles, what do you make of this recent uh, the, the, the resignation of Patrick Moore? I've been hearing rumours that Patrick Moore has left Greenpeace International um, over the the climate change. What he what he's referring to the climate change um, rubbish, basically that, and that he doesn't believe in um, in, in in human man made climate change. Or, uh, have you heard anything about that? I've, just a recent report I've been hearing myself. I haven't. That's kind of mind blowing to me. Uh, it's uh, it's. I, I do know that Greenpeace is a highly stratified political organization, and one of its past heads, of course, has come out and said that nuclear power is the way to go. Um, and there are indications. I you know, it's. I I know. I'm fr I'm very familiar with the work of Greenpeace in certain countries, uh, but when it comes to a more globalized view. Of, of what they do and, and how and, and who resigns over what and then goes out and says climate change is not is is, is not man-made that's that's surprising to me 
But I also know that in, in, in say, for instance, uh, a particular case in Russia, uh, when it came to um, environmental organizations being invited by the government to register their opinions on whether or not the Sochi Olympics should be held, the, this, that, the, by which I mean the 2014 Olympics, uh, Winter Olympics, uh, should be held in Sochi, uh, both the Russian offices of Greenpeace uh, and the WWF, uh, as well as a, as well as a smaller group uh, called Environmental Watch and the Northern Caucasus, we're all inv we're all invited to contribute their environmental expertise to a report that made its way to uh, the Department of the Interior uh, of Russia, uh, which said basically, you don't want to do this. It's kind of like having it's kind of like trying to do the uh, Winter Olympics in Miami. Uh, you know, where uh, it, it's uh, it's a lot of swamp land that's where a lot of wetlands, I should say, that are going to get destroyed. Uh, the, architecturally speaking, you're not going to you, you, you're uh, the, 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 the stadiums and so on that you build are going to be sinking after about a year, uh, if not before. Uh, you're going to displace a huge amount of the population. You're going to interrupt migratory patterns, etc. Uh, and one group. Uh, the, the smaller group, Environmental Watch in the Northern Caucasus, which is based there uh, in Sochi, uh, continued its studies, uh, despite the fact that environmental law had been rewritten <laughs> while everybody else was submitting their information, uh, and uh, uh, it was decided to have the Olympics in Sochi regardless of what anybody had to say. So Greenpeace backed off of it. Uh, as did the WWF, and uh, the WWF actually started began running uh, advertisements to the effect in Russian newspapers to the effect that it's completely, completely environmentally safe to have the Olympics in Sochi. Um, what we now know is that the is that UNESCO is just about to strip that area of its World Heritage status. Uh, because of the damage that was done, uh, because the Environmental Watch in the Northern Caucasus is stuck with uh, reporting on the environmental devastation and the IOC's own violation of its own zero waste policy, um, one of their members had to one of one of uh, Environmental Watch on the Northern Caucasus uh, members had to flee the country. Uh, and seek political asylum in Estonia, uh, another uh, is in jail. Mm -hmm. um, basically, of course, just to, just to highlight, you, you know, you've been covering those stories. Now, on, on the Bologna.org website, uh, if you scroll down the right to subjects, uh, with, the, with that, those stories about this person you're just about to talk about, uh, would that be under the Russian human rights issues? Tag. Russian human rights issues and uh, the subdivision there is Sochi Olympics. Okay, right. So, so that's the way to get to what uh, the, the the backstory of what uh, uh, Charles is talking about for those out there. So, uh, carry on, Charles. Sorry, mate. <laughs> yeah, and the, the the name of the prisoner who has been named a prisoner of conscience by Amnesty International and has been filing appeal after appeal for early release. Uh, he was jailed for uh, well, excuse me. He was sent to a prison colony. Uh, for allegedly spray painting this forest is ours on a construction fence that was erected in a uh, a, na a national park. Um, you're not allowed to put you, by Russian legislation. You're not allowed to put up national. You're not allowed to put up fences or build anything uh, in national parks. But it just so happened that the construction fence that he's that that he's, he is accused of spray painting on uh, surrounded the governor of the Krasnodar region's uh, summer home. Now, the Krasnodar region is where Sochi is located, uh, and the governor, uh, Alexander Tkachov, was uh, extremely involved in, I mean, he was tasked by Putin uh, with making the Olympics happen, uh, in accepting certain uh, bendings and or breakings of environmental law in that region. Uh, in order to build a, you know, a ski jump here or an ice, uh, an ice rink there or what have you. Um, as a result of that, 
and there, I mean, there were there were numerous other people too who who benefited, including Putin himself, who benefited from from huge uh, estates in the forest, the the, the forest areas surrounding Sochi along the Black Sea. Uh, the the uh, Alexei II, uh, who is uh, 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 the patriarch of Russia, he he has a he has a nice little onion dome. Uh, mansion out in the woods, not too far down the road from Putin's giant one, uh, which is uh, very close to the one that uh, that uh, uh, Vitishko is accused of, uh, whose fence Vitishko is accused of defacing. Um, now, um, three years in a prison colony is a fairly harsh sentence for that, um, you know, to say the least. Uh, that's something that 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 under under Russian law carries with it about a, uh, to you and me, would be about a $20 fine. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> so, well, it, uh, it was actually two years for Sister Megan Rice, it has to be said. Uh, she did two years, uh, 83 or something. Well, he was, I'm sorry? Uh, Sister Megan Rice did two years in prison oh, yes. for the same thing, more right. or less. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, we were, see, you know, we were seeing a lot of people taking the same page out of each other's books here. Sure. Um, <laughs> in that case, um, but uh, you know, in this, you know, it, they, both uh, both the guy who fled the country was uh, uh, um, uh, a fellow by the name of uh, uh, Suran Gazarian, who was a Georgian uh, by birth, uh, and Evgeny Vitushko, uh, the other fellow who helped write the report, the envir environmental report, which was initially solicited by the government. Um, they uh, the, the the treatment they received at the hands of the government uh, was uh, you know essentially a uh, you know first they were given suspended sentences uh, they appealed the suspended sentences by that time because Iran had fled the country uh, and that's when it turned into a real jail sentence um, so in any case that there's a lot of resentment behind it. Uh, a lot of very specific re uh, uh, resentment against that particular uh, uh, NGO. Uh, and in particular, the authors of that report, which expose uh, in, in systematic fashion where the money was misspent, how much of it was spent on these mansions, and how much of it was spent to bribe local officials to ignore environmental law. Sure, and, sure. and then actually rewrite it uh, at, the level, at the level of the, of the Russian parliament. And I have to say, you, you have a whole series of uh, articles about this, which I, I was uh, reading amazingly. And, and you've been incredibly supportive to the, the prisoner, you know, um, and, and been doing uh, sort of amazing, you know, support work and getting his info out. And I, I don't think that these uh, these Russians, they're, they're getting off scot-free because there are people out there that know kind of what they've done. And that's thanks to your reporting, obviously, you know. Well. I, I thank you for that assessment. Um, and yeah, it's it's uh, you know, I, 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 when I was I, I I met him before he was convicted and sent off to jail, uh, right right before the Olympics, and you know stayed through the Olympics while he was uh, convicted and sent to you know he basically bounced around the entire prison system until they finally found a prison colony to set him in, uh, and uh, it, it was it, it was a it was a, it, it's the kind of case that I'm familiar with watching in Russia, where one particular person gets singled out for, you know, what they feel to be the sins of many, um, and is used as a, a, a scapegoat for all other opposition, but more importantly, is an example to everybody else to shut up. I mean, of course, we have a recent uh, uh, sort of uh, situation that occurred uh, where that's uh, uh, that has happened again. Um, would you like to sort of give us a bit of feedback on on uh, the uh, Russian uh, nuclear activist who fled to uh, France? And ah, up. yes, uh, that's uh, Nadezhda Kutyapova. Uh, she is. Uh, she has for uh, since 1994 run. Uh, or well, she ran an NGO in a closed nuclear city uh, called Ozirsk, which is where uh, the Mayak chemical combine is located. Mayak is where Russia built its bomb uh, in 1947, I believe it was. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong with the date, uh, but that's when they developed their first uh, operable uh, nuclear bomb. 
uh, and it was uh, the entire closed city uh, community uh, of Russia contributed to its to, to its making. Uh, but she, Azersk is where it happened. Now Azersk was also uh, as home to the as home to Mayak is home to an, an enormous amount of weapons, uh, nuclear weapons waste. And in 1957, uh, a storage tank uh, that was holding that waste exploded uh, and sent uh, radioactivity all over the Chelyabinsk region, uh, which is just tucked on the, uh, the Siberian side of the lower Ural Mountains. Uh, and she has single she her she, she had a personal investment in this because her mother her, her mother became ill uh with radiation poisoning because she she participated in the cleanup uh of this nuclear disaster which was sold to the residents of Azivsk uh as a coal-fired power plant accident they had no idea what they were mopping up with rags they had no idea that they were mopping up radioactivity uh, as a result, she has been for since 1994, when her mother was diagnosed and who's since passed away, uh, has been fighting for compensation uh, for victims of that particular disaster, which is Chernobyl's older brother um, and lesser known older brother, uh, one might add. Um, and uh, because she's been operating in the confines of a closed nuclear military city in Russia, of course, she came under special scrutiny. Uh, she was working not only for compensation for victims of that particular disaster, she was working for the relocation of people who live along the river where Mayak, poison, Mayak pours its nuclear waste, which the river itself has actually been ruled nuclear waste. Um, there are about 70,000 people who live along there who on a daily basis graze their cattle in radioactive water, who swim in it themselves. Um, and in April of this year, uh, her organization was named by the Justice Ministry as a foreign agent. Um, because she was in a closed city, uh, a closed nuclear city, which is uh, the the administration of which is usually, uh, not usually, it's pretty much always uh, run by Russia's security services. Uh, she was then targeted in July by a series of uh, uh, documentary reports, as you might say, as they were so called, on Russian television about how she was a spy. Um, and upon consulting her lawyer, uh, and 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 certainly in because she knows she knows that that, that reports like that tend to become fact, uh, she was advised to leave the country. So her and her three children packed up, uh, had uh, uh, or, you know her her she had friends who bought her plane tickets and train tickets and so on to get them to Moscow and on a plane to Paris so that she could apply for political asylum there. Uh, because because treason charges were in in the eyes of her lawyer and certainly in the eyes of official TV, which is the voice of the Kremlin, uh, imminent. Sure. Uh, so she was actually granted political asylum. Now lives in Paris, uh, and she and her family are kind of couch surfing uh, from one you know good Samaritan to the next, uh, you know, while she goes through the slow process of trying to um, register her children in school, make sure they learn French, uh, learn French herself, uh, and uh, basically pick up, pick up from nothing. Her organization has since been dissolved, so there's nobody down there now defending the rights of these people who, by, by a Russian law of 1958, should be evacuated from the area, but never were. Uh, sure, that's that's quite a big blow to those people. Actually, it has to be said, and that's that's kind of 
been forgotten in the uh, the reporting of this and there has been some reporting thank heavens uh, but uh, but certainly even in uh, sort of uh, uh, the media which is anti-russian it it hasn't picked up on this story mainly because probably because she's highlighting nuclear issues and of course we see they cover the fukushima and uh sellafield messes up quite quickly so uh, <laughs> But fortunately, there's some alternative uh, media and independent journalists out there that uh, are trying to get the word out. Um, uh, Charles, uh, sorry, Jimmy, is there anything you'd like to uh, to bring in here, actually? Uh? Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, but, um, just uh, just a quick reference, though, to the uh, to the charges of treason against that lady, and uh, I think we're seeing a kind of a, a scary trend because uh, I think we covered a story there not too long ago about the. Uh, the, the German uh, blogger or, or news agency and uh, some one of their reporters also got charged with treason for highlighting some of the issues surrounding um, their secret service spying on its own people. So we're, we're seeing a lot of this um, accusations of treason, like uh, for, for for highlighting certain issues, like we're, we're uh, like uh, Edward Snowden type issues, and then anti-nuclear type NGOs. It, 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 there's a bit of a trend going on here, I believe. But um, but to move on a little bit now, I wanted to bring it back to the climate change here too, while we still have a little bit of time left. And I did come across a really interesting story there during the week and um, the headline was more or less Exxon Mobil targets journalists and activists after climate change investigation. Now this was written by Melissa Cronin and it was, I got it through a site called motherboardvice.com now and uh, an investigation found that Exxon Mobil had been funding climate denying organizations despite the findings of its own scientists on climate change. Uh, the world's fourth largest oil company is now going after the journalists who revealed it. Uh, evidence that Exxon Mobil had uh, been deliberately leading a campaign of misinformation about climate change for decades began cropping up after Inside Climate News, uh, which is a Pulitzer Prize winning publication, uh, uh, led an investigation into the company. Uh, shortly after the investigation uh, w was released, Exxon released a statement denouncing the report saying that they uh, wrongly suggest uh, definitive conclusions were reached decades ago by the company's researchers. Um, it's just that the reason why this is important because we're seeing a kind of a trend here also because I think there was also um, an article came out there not too long ago that BP also had information going back decades uh, about the uh, the implications of climate uh, change due to um, the use of petroleum products and and, and 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 all these types of industries really I suppose we can we can put them under one umbrella but I, I, ju I just wanted to bring that in there and bring it back to the climate change Charles, if you want to, in the time we have left, maybe, have you heard about that? I did, and I, I find that fascinating because it's, uh, um, well, fascinating and also kind of business as usual uh, for the oil industry. Um, and my my direct experience with that, of course, you know, has to do with the B, has to do with the BP spill. But what um, if when when you examine uh, BP's operations in the United States, uh, they have on various occasions, uh, uh, aside from aside from from wide scale spying uh, on environmentalists and journalists uh, and uh, threats to journalists called in the middle of the night or casually passed on at large gatherings of, you know, supposedly you know, scientific reporting on, you know, how well the golf is doing five years after the, uh, the, um, uh, BP spill. I mean, I, I was, I was threatened. Um, and, uh, the, the, the depths, uh, and, and really how long it goes back, uh, you know, the security firm that works for, uh, BP to handle, you know, kind of crowd control here on the Gulf. Uh, which had no real authority to arrest or prevent anybody from, you know, entering public beaches and taking pictures of oil slicks, uh, but would anyway. Uh, also was responsible for security uh, on the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline, um, in which, of which BP was a co-owner. And uh, not to get too deep into the specifics of the particular case, but there was uh, uh, the, um there was a whistleblower 
uh, who was targeted by uh, Wackenhut Security, which has now been absorbed by uh, G4S. Am I am I correct? I, I should yeah. know yeah, that. Yeah, G4S. Up. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. correct. The corporate corporate security company. Yeah. And there's I've got an article on that, but the, the how how far back that kind of intimidation goes, and what they did in Alaska when you talk to say. Uh, eyewitnesses like Dr. Ricky Ott, who is a uh, who is a vocal critic of the oil industry in Alaska, uh, she can speak to the number of you know f bogus NGOs that sprung up uh, to uh, forward the message of uh, you got no reason to worry. It's it's you know we're, the dispersant is the dispersant we're using on the oil spills is as safe as laundry soap. Uh, um, the, 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 the spying campaigns on, you know, established organizations where they would sort of send, you know, the kind of, you know, Mata Hari types to try to vamp information out of environmentalists and, you know, sleep with them so that they could get the goods on them. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. that happened yeah. in the UK. Yeah, the, the honey the, traps. Yeah. The honey and, traps. And they spied on the the uh, the uh, t uh, the MP that basically was going to bring that up. That was approached to sort of mention this as a big problem because these guys were uh, making women pregnant and then wandering off. You know. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, carry on. Uh, that's I just couldn't resist right. putting that. Bit. Uh, the, yeah. The, the the funding of the funding of uh, enormous you know pseudoscience campaigns is, is something that the oil industry, it may not have invented it, but it, but it certainly honed it to a science. Um, and uh, the, the, the lengths to which, you know, say a $2 million donation can go to an independent organization to shut it up are fairly incredible. Um, the, you know, in, in, in terms of how BP operated here on the Gulf, uh, you know, any, it, I mean, nobody around here knows about climate change. You, you go talk to your average uh, person on the well, you know, person in a pickup truck in the South, and they had, you know, they've they've heard the terminology before, but it really takes, uh, you know, it really takes a sort of educated, uh, say, you know, person who's running a an oyster farm or who's involved in marine biology or who's connected to a university that wasn't bought off by P by BP to actually talk about climate change. Oh, um, so they're manipulating it, just more than the BP Gulf oil spill information. It's, exactly. Uh, no, it's a much I mean, bigger it's, operation, if you like. Right. And uh, one particular scientist who I'd like to, whose, whose name I'd, I'd like to to bring up is Dr. Samantha Joy, who uh, whose studies revealed that the correct that the dispersant, which is known as Corexit, that was used in the BP oil spill, actually killed the microbial community on the floor of the Gulf, thus making it imp making it impossible for the microbial community to do its job and eat the sunken oil. Um, has uh, you know she she's a uh, she takes a very holistic approach to studying the spill, which is something that you know every scientific organizations should do because I mean the the Gulf has kind of been the toilet of the United States for you know since about 1945 they've dumped chemical munitions out there they uh, the, the 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 space between Baton Rouge and, and and New Orleans has more chemical refineries than anywhere else in the United States uh, the amount of stuff that pours out of the amount of agricultural waste beginning in Minnesota all the way down uh, the course of the Mississippi River that pours out into the Gulf creates a dead zone about the size of Rhode Island or Connecticut, um, where nothing grows, where there, there are no fish, etc. right there in the Delta at the end of Louisiana, uh, which also then leads to erosion of the wetlands and then makes us, of course, more susceptible to uh, hurricanes. Uh, there's nothing to stop the water. There's nothing to stop the wind. Uh, and the next biggie that hits, you know, it you could you, you're conceivably looking at a uh, a Rube Goldberg machine of uh, orphaned oil wells plus perhaps an oil spill uh, plus what's already out there uh, entering the streets of New Orleans. Um, Sounds like a sort of an eternal pro, uh, problem, you know, with all those thousands of oil wells that are out there and the cap exactly. more thousands of capped ones. And so on. Right, exactly. But the, the the campaigns against 
uh, Dr. Joy, uh, who is at the University of Georgia, and so thus kind of far enough removed from, you know, geographically speaking, from where the spill actually took place, uh, uh, has been has been profound since uh, since since the since the spill occurred. She discovered the plumes, and she's then now been she's now been sort of ferreting through the information that she has. Uh, and saying, okay, well, this is th this particular detrimental effect is caused by dire directly by the oil spill. This particular detrimental effect is caused by climate change. Uh, this combination of the two factors makes this one detrimental effect even worse. Um, you know, for instance, this summer we saw an outbreak of. Uh, uh, a bacteria called Vibrio vulnificus along the coast, uh, which uh, I believe in Florida it killed about 12 people. Uh, figures aren't really available for Mississippi or Alabama, uh, but that is something that is that 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 is a uh, according to Dr. Joy uh, is a uh, a direct uh, uh, the, the the multiplication of that particular bacteria. Uh, or bacterium, excuse me, uh, is uh, a, a, a direct is a direct correlation with with uh, with really how hard climate change is hitting the Gulf. Yeah. Um, so, and, and, and there's also the fact that we've covered here on uh, European News Weekly uh, the fact that the Atlantic eel um, has uh, been on the extinction list since 2012. Mm -hmm. So you know, and that affects Europe. Because, uh, and I'm sure there are other uh, migration species that may have been affected as well. Well, uh, at, yeah. a, at a minute though, uh, well, w while we're talking about this, uh, and uh, we, we've got 10 minutes left, guys, but I've, I've just come across also a study about algal blooms, algal blooms and, and uh, a connection between the algal blooms and the die-off of the, of the whales. And we, we seem to be having a big, huge die-off of whales, which they, that while it hasn't been sort of announced as definitive proof, there's a clear connection between the die-offs of these fish and the algal blooms. And I assume in the Gulf of Mexico, a lot of these poisons that are being uh, pumped into that sea are, are, are creating these blooms there. Would, would that be correct, uh, Charles? That's, uh, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that statement. Uh, I, th I think it's actually happening all over the coastlines of uh, most of the planet where, where we have farmland doing runoff with high nitrogen and all this kind of stuff, you know. That's exactly right, Sean. And I, I think that um, <coughs> here on the Gulf, <coughs> excuse me, okay. we can get a little bit uh, <coughs> stuck in a tunnel vision uh, uh, approach to it uh, and say, okay, these these odd events, uh, you know, these the, what the NOAA calls harmful algae blooms, and what fishermen call red tides, uh, which are the same thing, and deoxygenate the water, kill fish, uh, you know, turn beaches into morgues uh, with you know dead fish all over the place or dead sea life all over the place. Um, we're seeing those a lot more frequently since the spill. Uh, so over the past five years, uh, you've seen red tide incidents kill, uh, oyster populations. You've seen them blamed for, uh, uh, the, the death of clam farming, uh, or, uh, and, and, well, clam aquaculture, uh, farming is probably not the correct term for it. Um, and those... The, the areas that seem to be the most affected are kind of the the armpit of the uh, of the Gulf of Mexico, by which I mean uh, the hook from the west coast of Florida up through Alabama and and to Mississippi, just a little bit. So uh, that's about a that's about a, a nine nine hundred to th you know thousand two hundred stretch of coastline. Uh, and then you can just sort of square that off uh, to visualize where uh, these, these algae blooms are, are happening most frequently. Um, as I say, in the Gulf, a lot of people say, all right, well, that's got to be caused somehow by uh, the, uh, the, by the Exxon, by, I'm sorry, by the, by the BP spill. Now, there is some scientific evidence to suggest that that might be the case. 
but at the same time, I think that, you know, the, the Gulf being this kind of still body of water within a larger ocean uh, is a lot more susceptible or, uh, or so I've been told uh, by those who know better than me, uh, is uh, a place where you will see a lot of the effects of climate change happen uh, at, at, a fair, at, at, at a tempo that's, that's you know, fairly quicker than anywhere else. Okay. Uh, okay. So it cor that then corresponds to me, as you tell me about the harmful algae blooms that you've seen listed uh, and reported on in other places, uh, that all coalesces into a warmer ocean. Um, the algae blooms happen here because the water's warmer. Um, and it's, you know, average, uh, on, you know, average temperatures have been rising. Uh, and, of course, you have the nitrogen and CO2 absorption, uh, which also aids in that procedure, or aids in that process. Uh, so that being the case, um, the, the, connections between, the connections between all of these things, you know, as, as they're studied on the Gulf with some of the world's best oceanographers, uh, you know, they also, have to, it's, 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 they also have to keep in view, you know, a wider uh, effect on the ocean ecosystem as a whole. So we're talking about 70% of the planet that they have to keep their eyes on. Uh, which is a lot of information to digest. Um, so there's a, a it's uh, the, the the interesting connection between uh, oil industry business as usual, deep sea drilling, uh, especially here in the Gulf. Now that people have decided, now that some of the larger corporations have decided to back off the Arctic, um, uh, and the effects of climate change. Uh, you know, it's con it's kind of convenient for um, for some institutions that are either you know have either been supportive of BP uh, or who are involved in what's called the Natural Resources D uh, Disaster Assessment, which is a group of uh, agencies like NOAA, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, the EPA, uh, BP. <laughs> Uh, and uh, who are who are producing a body of scientific data that they have not yet released, which is supposed to give us all of the answers about what and, and it, about what is attributable to the oil spill and what must be attributed to other forces uh, and what is actually okay. Totally, now, uh, totally unbiased. Right, exactly. Of course, with BP sitting there, you know, doing the running the running the black magic marker to redact the text, you can be assured that it's going to be absolutely one hundred percent. Very, very so quickly. I, I've got yeah, yeah. If we if we could do this quickly, Sean, because I hate to be a party pooper, but um, it, I've got to hand the stream over to OIM in five minutes' that, time. Have we got so. five minutes? Is that, is that right? Oh, that's you. You haven't anymore, so hurry up. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, like three stories very quickly while you're here. Uh, I might get you to comment on one of them or something. Uh, one is uh, from the campaign opposing police surveillance on Facebook, right? So basically, they have uh, put out a story about the UK police have been uh, in 17 countries in undercover operations. Uh, that's just following on a little bit we were talking about uh, surveillance in the Gulf uh, with uh, Charles there. Uh, the second one, which I definitely have to mention very quickly, is that the Irish votes on welcoming Snowden into the EU, EU European Union, were as follows. Uh, four were Lynn Bolan, Matt McCarthy, Nessa Childers, Luke Ming Flanagan, Marion Harkin and Leon, Leon, Liad Ni Riada. And if you go to Sean Arclight on uh, Facebook, uh, you can scroll down and you can get the whole story, plus the uh, uh, Irish MPs that, or TDs that voted for uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, against uh, uh, Snowden being allowed onto the EU. Obviously, Whoa. he's been allowed, onto, uh, allowed to, well, they put a, a, a petition out to say that he should be welcomed into the EU with protections. Uh, third story is uh, Norway's dash for Arctic oil violates its own constitution, and that's on the ecologist.org. Um, well, um, <laughs> do you want to comment very quickly? Two on minutes, any Charles. Of those you, you've got two minutes there, Charles. So, okay, but is the last one on the Norwegian oil thing? Yeah, you might as well. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> st st stay out of the NSA's grasp. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I, it's, none of that is terribly surprising to me. 
uh, you know, given the climate in, the, in, in which we're living online uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, it, it, I don't know, I, I, I suppose my own attitude toward it, uh, having lived for, you know, any number of years through Russian surveillance is just, you know, well, I'm just don't say anything but for the benefit of their microphones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, it seems to be, I mean, I, I remember times when I've been blogging that I've been saying certain things in certain ways and then just doing something entirely different all of a sudden. <laughs> you know. uh, but, uh, you know, I think it's definitely uh, going back to the Snowden thing, though, vaguely. Can I put a little plug in here quickly for Candice Paul, who was yes. very, who was uh, gl gladly, uh, was delighted to have on there in the oh, first half of the show. Just, just before you do, there's oh. a quick plug uh, to the gentleman that was arrested at Castle Bell Court. He'll be on, uh, he should be on uh, VIN on PIR, People's Internet Radio, at 9 p.m. He's being interviewed tonight. Oh, that. good stuff, good stuff. And uh, if, if you want to support Candice Paul, who was on a little bit earlier on the show, and help the, uh, the Native Peoples, uh, she's dropped a little email address to where you can uh, order uh, uh, her books. And it's, uh, let's see if I can get this right, uh, uh, Committee uh, for Urgent Generation. Uh, co is, is that right there, Sean? Can you read that? Uh, committee uh, right, for future, exactly. committee for future generations at gmail dot com. So that's the committee for future generations yes. at gmail dot com, and you can support the native uh, Canadian Indians uh, uh, by buying a little book there from Candies. And uh, Charles, anything you want to round up on? Uh, I'll just say you can also catch Candies Paul on uh, Facebook on uh, First Nations Say No. And uh, so if you go there, you can uh, check that out as well. And we'll link that to the European. Uh, news.wordpress.com website uh, and we're going to get those posts up in the next couple of days so charles thanks very very much it was it's been great having you back uh, i really appreciate having having you here for the last hour and uh, and, and a bit it's been brilliant uh, much appreciated my I friend appreciate being here and i thank you guys for inviting me on Okay, and we'll be leaving a link to uh, to your uh, uh, sort of uh, petition for donations, uh, and uh, maybe a couple of links to uh, some some of your Bologna articles about some of the things that you've been talking about as well. I'd appreciate that. I thank you very much. Everything helps. Uh, we'll get that in the next couple of days. I'm a bit of a slow mo on the uh, post uh, production stuff at the moment. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's fine. It's we're, you know it's I, I'm just I will be in Paris. I will report on this. Uh, however, I have to. Uh, so any 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 extra funding is certainly certainly appreciated. Five I've, bucks or what have you, whatever you can do, it's great. Good stuff. So I have to work. drop. I have to drop now, guys. So <laughs> okay, hold the line. Hold the line. Okay.